Hello, my name is Jacob Kierkegaard and I'm a senior fellow at the Peterson Institute for International Economics. And on behalf of uh, the Institute and our president, Adam Posen, it is a pleasure uh, to welcome you to our digital platform this morning, afternoon or evening, depending on where you join us uh, from around the world. Um, of course, all Peterson Institute events are important and timely, but, but in all honesty, there are some events that are more timely and more important than others. And I'm happy to say that uh, we have one of those events uh, right now, uh, because it is a particular pleasure for me to, to welcome uh, to our <coughs> online uh, platform, Oleg Ostenko, the Chief Economic Advisor to Ukrainian President Zelensky, uh, today to discuss the government of Ukraine's economic vision for Ukraine, both in the short and the long run, and not least how he and his colleagues in Kiev uh, believe that we, around the world, uh, what we can do, uh, but you know, particularly from the United States and the European Union, what we can do to help Ukraine's economy and efforts right now. Dr. Rostenko was appointed uh, Chief Economic Advisor uh, in May 2019, uh, and his brief covers all major economic policies including macroeconomics, investments, business climate, uh, and of course, uh, everything related to uh, the current tragic events. Dr. Rosengo has extensive experience from both the private and public sectors, including work at the World Bank, OECD, and senior government levels. He holds a master's from Harvard uh, and a PhD from Kiev State University. Um, our event will take one hour, and you should have received an email link uh, through which you can submit questions uh, to be posed to Dr. Ostenko uh, later in the program. <clears throat> but first of all, dear Oleg, uh, welcome today. And I hope uh, that circumstances are uh, as good as they can be. Thank you um, very much. Thank you. Uh, but first, let me just ask you, uh, to try again to spell out for us uh, how you and your colleague think that, that, that we, government and the rest of the world, corporations, private citizens, how can we best help the economy of Ukraine and your efforts at this moment? Thank you very much. Thank you very much for this opportunity to share with you uh, my views, uh, you know, from uh, the Ukrainian land, uh, let me please start by saying that, uh, in fact, the humanitarian disaster now in Ukraine is much worse than anybody can imagine. Babies are dying. You obviously heard yesterday uh, about this bombing of the maturity hospital in Mariupol. Uh, you uh, understand that uh, the situation is... Uh, the disaster, I would say, really uh, much deeper than somebody can imagine. Uh, people are living underground, uh, including Kiev, including Kharkov. They're spending their time in the subway, metro. Uh, very little clean water. We have family members, uh, 15 minutes drive from Ukraine, who are surrounded uh, by uh, Russian uh, fascists troops uh, with no uh, possibility uh, to get out. Uh, two cell phones from the family, uh, family were already uh, taken uh, by uh, soldiers. And we immediately, I mean, they immediately reported uh, to us and they were using only uh, one uh, cell phone which was left uh, with a kid who is six years old, so the guy uh, was able to get this phone, so we were able to block everything. Uh, people are living without uh, food, uh, without water, for example, this 15 minutes drive uh, distance from here, our family members uh, needed to melt the snow in order to have at least some uh, water. Initially, they were using it as a technical water. Now, as we understand, they're boiling this water and drink this water. Uh, we have uh, hundreds of deaths, uh, but soon it will be thousands. Uh, for me and for us here, 
in, uh, on the ground, it's very clear that the Russians are losing the war. But uh, in our understanding, they do not want to tell it uh, to their boss. So the boss, this you know, mother, blood mother, Putin, uh, doesn't really know in our understanding what's really happening, what, what is really happening. And uh, he still believes that he is, you know, managing the army and managing this country. But uh, in my view, they, it's very, very clear they are losing the war. So if uh, these people on the ground, I mean, uh, his army are not willing uh, to uh, say anything bad, like uh, bad news to their boss, uh, that's why they started really to kill civilians. Uh, they are why they are doing that. They are trying or they are hoping uh, not to capture, but to get in to the big cities of Ukraine. That's why they are so desperately aggressive now. I know, of course, I know that uh, you are an economic think tank, and that uh, you don't spend uh, much time on the war. And I am happy. I'm really happy to talk about key economic elements today. But let me emphasize that what we need most of all is more weapons and ammunition for our army. This is critically important. We are entirely focused on destroying our enemies. We are sending, we are trying to make sure and we do everything we can in order to send home every Russian tent, every armed vehicle back to Russia. We are, you know, we are killing their soldiers. But for that, we need weapons, we need ammunition. And what we need most of that, of all, is of course to save Ukrainian lives. This leads me to the key economic points of today. First of all, first of all, uh, there must be a complete embargo on the purchase of energy from Russia. We are really, really, really grateful to the United States of America who are re really leading and uh, with these efforts uh, by introducing this ban uh, on Russian oil and gas as soon as possible. I know how pipelines work. And I understand that Europeans do not want to be cold. And as I understand the temperature now in uh, Berlin is somewhere, let's say, close to seven degrees Celsius. And in France, in Paris, it's a little bit the same. And it's going to be a little bit more cold than tomorrow, sounds like, according to the weather forecast. But I can ensure you that it's much, much, much colder in the underground of Ukraine, where people are hidden. Uh, in all our, you know, in all these shelters where they have to spend days and nights already for 15 days, people are trying, you know, to save their lives. It's, it's uh, uh, Kharkov, where, you know, with children handled together, with almost no blankets, there's almost or very few toilets in the underground. You know, people who are crying, you know, without access to normal water, to drinking water. So I, I would say that uh, what is really needed to be done is to introduce the full embargo, full embargo worldwide on Russian oil and gas industry. This is a blood money, really blood money, which Europeans are still paying to this monster in order to kill our people, innocent people, civilians in our country, in Ukraine. This is something what is really needed to be done. And if, if you know, the government of Europe are still discussing this issue, which I think is just not acceptable, not acceptable, because we are losing our lives here, losing our kids. Number of reported of 
uh, rape women in the country. We already have more than a hundred reports of that kind, you know, of rape in our uh, women. Uh, so in, 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 the, in my view, this is something which is necessary to be done, necessary to be done. And that's why today in several newspapers, including the UK, Austria, uh, France, uh, some other countries, I published an open uh, letter to the people of these countries that they have to follow the path if the governments are not able to stop uh, supplying, supplying a Russian monster with their bloody money, people of these countries have to act very quickly and very hard in order to stop that. Therefore, we are initiating this boycott campaign uh, for all Russian oil, yes. Uh, otherwise, you know, otherwise I don't see the reasons why why we are on one hand or a civilized world on one hand is, you know, feeding the monster on the other hand is, you know, trying to help us in different formats in sending, you know, uh, to our civilians, uh, clothes, food, water, all that stuff. So it's for sure it should be stopped. And if it's not stopped, we have a very uh, clear logic how it's going to be stopped. And in our view, if we track, and we are already tracking each tanker loaded with this uh, duty Russian oil, each tanker is tracked. We know where tanker, uh, tanker is coming. We are tracking it. And we will make sure that this tanker will, should not be and will not be unloaded in any courts of the world. And I also count not only on the people of the world, but I also count on uh, institutions like you who might be passing this message worldwide, because it's really important. We have to cut off Putin from this bloody money, which he is using for killing our people. So for me, it's the most important question. And if we have an evidence that somebody, any private public company is buying that kind of duty oil from Putin, then we will make all efforts in order to destroy the shareholder values of this company. This is very, you know, this is, it should be, it should be really the common initiative coming all over the world. And as I said, we already started it. Another point, which I guess it's also in terms of economics, we have to discuss, it's also in terms of the food global security. As you might know, Ukraine is an important player on international agro market. In some products, we are, uh, for example, like wheat, we are number five. In terms of uh, sunflower oil, we are supplying 50% of the international market. You know, the same with the barley, with uh, some other stuff, we uh, control around between 15 to 20 percent of uh, different groups of uh, on agro markets uh, of different commodities but at the same time what we uh, the current picture is the following since 15 percent of our economy is dependent on agro sector we have to do our homework and our homework is to work in the field and usually when we are starting our uh, spring soaring campaign, we are starting it in the first decade, in the first week even, I would say, in the first week of March. And for it should be finalized, completely finalized, at the third week of April. So this is a very short period of time when we are doing our soaring campaign, our field works uh, in, uh, in our, uh, on, on our land. If we are not able to complete this work during this period of time, then we are not uh, having, uh, you know, anything at the end of the day. 
and it also means that it's going to be a huge challenge for the international market. For me and for everybody, uh, it's very clear that the prices are going up. So we are going to observe inflation, good inflation. And if inflation is coming up, then you have another issue, issue related to the global security. And I mean, I mean the, the issue that look, in uh, Poland, they spend one third of their consumer basket for food. In France or in Great Britain, it's somewhere around uh, one tenth of the consumer basket. But there are countries, for example, in Africa, where they are spending 90% uh, for food in their consumer baskets. And these countries should be supported internationally, and they are supported internationally. It means that the check to support these countries is going to be increasing uh, very soon. Even now, if you go to the uh, Chicago exchange, you can observe that the prices for other uh, commodities are increasing already. This is also uh, which we should keep in mind when we are talking about uh, peace efforts in Ukraine from the economic uh, point of view, because it's really, you know, uh, significant or serious challenges. Uh, with the world and risk which the world is facing uh, now. Um, the uh, sooner we are stopping the war, uh, the better uh, will be for the food uh, security uh, as well. So basically, let me stop here and, uh, you know, uh, take uh, questions and discuss, uh, you know, specific questions which are coming. Well, well, thank, thank you for, for, for conveying in a, in a very comprehensive manner the, the uh, truly tragic and dire situation that you face in, in, uh, in Ukraine. So if I would like to, to take uh, the next step, and, and you, you already mentioned the, the importance of some sanctions, uh, energy especially. Uh, I would like to ask you, uh, uh, on this issue of sanctions, there is also uh, a, an issue regarding, I mean, there is a lot of Russian individuals potentially going forward, also state entities uh, whose assets are being seized around the world. Um, do you view those assets uh, or you have a view on the use of those assets uh, also with uh, an eye to the inevitable, given the destruction that is being unleashed on Ukraine right now, uh, you know, how you, the legitimate government of Ukraine, will go about your, your vision for rebuilding your country, uh, and not least how you, you plan to finance that uh, reconstruction. Yeah, thank you uh, for this question. Uh, look, uh, currently, around 50% of our businesses are not operating. And those which are still operating, they're not operating at 100% of their uh, capacities. Meaning that, um, you know, the uh, situation uh, in terms of economic growth, in terms of all that stuff is going to be uh, really very depressing in Ukraine, even if the war is immediately stopped. And I hope that the war is going to be immediately stopped. Uh, for understanding very preliminary uh, you know, estimates which we have uh, in the office is that we already lost or the assets which were already destroyed. Uh, the value is around 100 billion US dollars, 100 billion US dollars. This is a very, you know, approximate um, uh, view in terms of uh, what was already lost. So, uh, of, of course, uh, when the peace is on my land, we have to rebuild the economy. Rebuilding the economy means also, you know, rebuilding the assets which were already destroyed. And this $100 billion, roads, bridges, hospitals, equipment, uh, which they, these people destroyed. For example, I don't know whether you heard or not, but in... Um, uh, uh, children oncological department in Kiev. These people, you know, uh, bombed uh, the building and uh, some of the very expensive. And, and keep, keep in mind that we are not rich country. Some very expensive equipment was already destroyed. Um, luckily, kids uh, were able to survive. But 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 this is what happened. Uh, so uh, what we count on, we count on the money 
which are already uh, which were uh, in uh, Russian in the Russian Central Bank uh, of foreign exchange reserves, and we are talking somewhere around three hundred billion. We think that this money should be directed uh, on once. Uh, on, there are several possibilities to use this money, and one is for sure we have to support those millions which we have now uh, refugees which we have all over the world. Uh, so this is one way to support people. And now a, a, a part of this money might be used uh, directly for rebuilding our uh, destroyed infrastructure, destroyed assets. So this is the way. Uh, then, of course, we are counting on a, a possibility to continue uh, resting all properties of Russian oligarchs. For this, I think that what we really need uh, to do, we need uh, to create already, and uh, I, hope, I, I think that the United States has or may uh, be willing uh, to have a leading role in here uh, to form uh, some kind of a special recovery, let's say recovery, uh, peace recovery fund for Ukraine. And uh, one of the uh, source, of course, is the money uh, which were already under arrest uh, uh, of uh, the Central Bank of Russia, of Russia. And another possibility is everything which is going to be taken away in the future uh, should be immediately, uh, the, the money of that asset should be also uh, coming to that fund. I know that probably we are not able to sell the assets immediately, but what we can do, we can issue uh, bonds um, uh, for, for that assets. And the money which we will be receiving from these, from selling these bonds might be coming again as a source uh, to uh, financing of this special recovery Ukrainian peace fund. So I think that it will be uh, extremely useful. It, 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 for, because of many reasons. First reason is, of course, we have to rebuild the economy. But another reason, it, it will be extremely positive signal which we can give the world to, to the world and to the people of my country that look on fire. Of course, you lost a lot. Of course, we lost many people already. You know, some people uh, are killed. You know, uh, families are destroyed. All, all, all that kind. But don't worry about the side of uh, the economic side uh, of this war, because the economic side of the war is going to be covered by us internationally. Internationally, it's going to be covered. So don't worry about that. We already have money, and that message, if uh, you, we are able to do that. Will be extremely, you know, useful, and it will help. It it it, it, will, it will really help uh, to Ukrainians who are fighting now, fighting mm -hmm. against this new Russian fascist. And, and uh, thank you very much. That was a, again an incredibly comprehensive question, uh, and and one that I think is fair to say also offers quite a bit of help and hope for the Ukrainian people. Um, and and speaking of hope, uh, I, I would like to to ask you again a sort of perhaps forward looking, more long term question. Uh, it's no secret. Uh, Foreign Minister Kuleba had an op ed uh, in a number of newspapers yesterday that uh, your government uh, is, is uh, seeking, uh, I think the word is expedited membership of the EU. Um, so I was, uh, now, I think it's also fair that we, we also know that, that this is uh, uh, legally and politically going to be very difficult, uh, but I would, I would like to ask you to, to describe for, uh, for our audience, your, uh, you and your colleagues longer term economic vision for post-war Ukraine, uh, because I mean, it's no secret that uh, among the Russian demands, for instance, uh, so far at least, has been that uh, Ukraine obviously should not be part of NATO, but uh, it seems also should not be able to join the EU. Uh, so, so could you tell us why you emphasize this, uh, why this is so important for you right at this moment? Look, uh the vision which we have in here. So basically, EU was the initial goal of Ukraine, even when we were not discussing it. And I mean, coming back 10, maybe more, 10 plus years ago, 
NATO uh, was on the table. We were discussing this issue, but the EU was the most, you know, powerful argument uh, for many, uh, many things, uh, for including political things in the country, in Ukraine. So EU was always the, I wouldn't even say the goal, it was always the dream for Ukrainians. Now Ukrainians are fighting. Uh, we are fighting not only for us, we are fighting for the civilized world and we are fighting for Europe as well. So uh, when it started this process, oh, I, I would call it fast track, right? This EU when it just started, couple of days ago or last week uh, when it, there was a discussion in Brussels in terms of that um, when we were submitting our application to EU. So everybody in Ukraine got some kind of so positive mood, so positive mood that for us it's understanding that yes people in Europe they understand that we are also Europeans, uh, they are willing uh, to help us, and very soon we are going to be a member of the EU. So it was positive in many sense, but you know, first of all, for the uh, population, uh, in in terms of food of the population, in terms of the attitude, we were expecting this step, and we are still expecting this, you know, step which should be taken by the Europeans very soon. But at the same time. When all these discussions started in Europe, uh, which we observe here uh, in Kiev, that one, uh, you know, one nation is saying, yes, maybe, yes, maybe, no, a little bit longer, everything will take longer time. So the general mood is that we are abused. This is what the uh, regular people on the streets or under the grounds are saying. We are abused. They promise, but they do not deliver. They will not deliver what they promise. And this is the usual way how Europeans operate. At least what people, civilians, I mean, uh, people uh, are uh, saying uh, in Ukraine. So for us, if, you know, we are not on the fast track of joining EU, it's going to be, I wouldn't even say it's a disaster, but it's going to be complete illusion in terms of what we were expecting and what we finally uh, got out of it. So uh, therefore, I just hope that uh, Europeans understand that. And since if or if they understand the logic, they have to uh, act very quick. At the same time, the question which some people, or even many people in Ukraine are also rising, why? us plus Moldova plus Georgia, just, just why, why, why they are making these games. They would like, you know, to have uh, this never happen or uh, they are doing that because they don't want, uh, you know, to do it quick, uh, very quickly on the fast track, uh, based on the fast track procedures, why they are doing that. So if it's not happened almost immediately, then it's going to be an extremely, you know, an extremely powerful hit uh, for the mood of uh, my people, and I don't, I, and I really don't want that. And even you can see that in 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 some of his, uh, you know, speeches, the president of the country, the, pre uh, the president Zelensky, he already says several times that uh, look, in terms of uh, NATO, we have a little bit different view now. In terms of the EU, we hope that uh, we really are a member of the EU uh, as fast as possible. But fast, as fast as possible, it doesn't mean that it's going to be, uh, you know, yes, no, no, no way for that uh, for us. If if it's really yes, then we don't care about uh, um, all this EU uh, traditional stuff. So we would like to have it as soon as possible. And this is actually the uh, rumor of the mood uh, in the office of the president as well. Everybody is expecting that it should be done almost immediately. What uh, it would be uh, for us economically, it means that we are part of Europe. We don't have tariffs. 
uh, we uh, could uh, be able to attract investments uh, from EU and all other parts of the world. We are operating in normal uh, business environment. Our legislation is completely or very close or will be very soon in line uh, with the system which is in Europe. Then we will be able uh, to grow. Then the life of our ordinary people is going to be better than all the stuff which we were needed, uh, you know, uh, to do for uh, one period of time will be done uh, very quickly. And here, I mean, everything what was uh, recalling the main obstacles uh, before in Ukraine. I am talking about. Uh, property rights protection, I'm talking about uh, court system, uh, I'm talking about uh, barriers for doing business, I'm talking about corruption, all that stuff. So all these things will be much to move forward this agenda. Uh, we'll be, uh, we will be able to move forward this agenda really very fast and it will change the life of ordinary Ukrainian. This is how I, I view the EU. So, so, so if I can just, just to be clear, I mean, certainly one of the most amazing positive surprises that we have seen in the last couple of weeks is the fighting capabilities of the Ukraine's armed forces. So what I just heard you say is that coming out of this struggle, you know, the EU, the, uh, the EU members are going to see a similar, if you like, positive surprise on the ability of Ukraine to quickly adopt uh, this long list of uh, uh, requirements that we we all know EU membership will uh, will entail. So EU members should not look at at what has happened in the past, but basically what a change the current tragedy uh, will do for the future. Is that is that correct? Correct. Absolutely correct. Exactly. Okay. Um, I, I would now like to shift to, to something perhaps more concrete uh, and specific. Uh, we've had a lot of, of uh, uh, you know, efforts attempt, attempting basically to uh, create instability in the Russian financial system. Uh, we've already talked about the blocking of central bank sanctions. We've had the disconnecting of several uh, Russian banking institutions, etc. But I, I would actually like to ask you, since <clears throat> you know the war is happening right now in Ukraine, but Ukraine also has a financial system. So, so could you could you talk to us a little bit about how what you are doing to prevent, to the extent that that you know people that it's safe for people to line up, but that they don't have to line up at the ATMs in the way that we have, for instance, seen it in Moscow. Well, you are very rightly pointed out in terms of uh, Russia. Yes, all these sanctions are working, and when I see these videos with the huge lines uh, to ATM machines somewhere in the Russian city, I feel myself happy. In terms of uh, Ukrainian system, uh, look, we are doing, I would say, okay uh, under, the, the, under the current circumstances. Um, first of all, uh, our uh, fiscal reserves are on okay level. It's something like 27.5 billion US dollars. Uh, before the aggression, we had somewhere around 30 billion US dollars. The exchange rate is more or less uh, stable. There were some, uh, and of course, there is some depreciation pressure, uh, but you know, overall, the situation is okay. Uh, we not depreciated, I would say, by, by between 5 to 7 percent, depending uh, on which time we are analyzing, but let's say roughly around 5%, so it's now uh, it's okay, it's nothing more than, in normal life, nothing more than, you know, just the fluctuation of the currency. In terms of uh, policy of the National Bank, I understand that they did not um, uh, increase the interest rate which they were planning to do initially, so we, they kept it as it is, just not to move anything. In terms of the ATM machine, this is what you were asking. We had that kind of crisis uh, during the first probably 
48 hours of war. But uh, look, I never saw uh, in Ukraine, even at that time, something like a huge line uh, to an ATM machine. In some cases, it's true, the, uh, the uh, people were not able uh, to use uh, their ATM card. Uh, no, not even ATM card, their credit cards to pay in the store, to pay in the shops. Uh, but, but, but it was for a very, very limited period of time, I would say hours probably, and that's it. Uh, so people were asking the store, they were asking for cash, and uh, they were not able to solve the cards. And it's not because they did not want to do that, but because the system was, uh, as I understand, disconnected. Uh, so there was a problem with uh, connections. That's why they were not able to use that. So uh, now, now, after the first 48 hours, the system started to work properly. Uh, so you can pay with your uh, cards, um, debit or credit cards uh, everywhere in Ukraine, as it used to be in the past. Uh, if you need cash, you can get cash, not even uh, the ATM machine. All supermarkets now are working as an ATM machine. They, basically, you can go with your card with your card and get cash if you really need uh, this cash so you can restore the cash uh, at the cashier uh, in the supermarket in the store so it's uh, from this point of view it's okay and even moreover the message which is coming from the national bank they are asking people uh, to use as much as possible uh, electronic money uh, basically cards rather than to use cash first of all it's safe um, more, then people are going to be more safe uh, but plus also keep in mind that it's not easy uh, to uh, physically uh, to get cash from here and to move it to any region of the country so even even those uh, cities which are surrounded now by uh, Russian army by a Russian fascist they are able uh, to use their cards to pay for uh, products. So from this point of view, is okay. In terms of the uh, budget, you know that initially we were planning that the fiscal deficit is going to be this year 3.5% of GDP. Obviously, it will not be the case now. Uh, thanks to uh, international help, uh, we are able uh, to fund our deficit. Um, Good news is that uh, we already cleaned the deal, as I understand. I don't know whether it's already public information or not, but my understanding is that uh, we already uh, have uh, new funds, or we are going to have it very soon from IMF. Uh, you know that uh, we receive money, um, so called um, macro financial support from EU. Uh, we have uh, US Treasury. Uh, guarantees uh, 1 billion, which was uh, issued for us even before uh, Russian aggressions. So we are able uh, to cover the deficit again because of our friends, otherwise it will be uh, next to impossible, uh, like in Russia, for example. That's why actually I think that it's so very much important to have uh, really this ban on uh, for the Russian oil and gas. We need to cut off these guys uh, from the bloody money they are receiving now. Every day they are having 700 million US dollars from oil plus 400 million uh, dollars from gas. So altogether more than 1 billion a day they are receiving in these bloody money receipts. So if you are cutting them off, then it's going to be a huge, huge, huge disaster in, in their uh, budget since the budget is at least 40% from, uh, from uh, that kind of um, financing. And if you have 40% uh, deficit, if, even if it's going to be low, because I assume that partly they will be able to sell uh, to China, but then the, of course this is a question, uh, what would be the price China will be willing to give for that oil like, and gas, and I assume that it's not going to be an international price, and they will be lucky, lucky if uh, Chinese are going to pay them half of the international price. But at the same time, you know, when you have that kind of deficit, the only way how they will be able to fund this deficit is only to print money. And we all know what, uh, what, what is the final you know, point of printing the money. 
they will start with just inflation, and I assume that inflation is hiking now in Russia. Otherwise, their central bank will not try the key interest rate, and this is what they did. The key interest rate is already 20%, so we can assume that even now they think that the lowest level of inflation is somewhere around 20%, but very soon it's going to be 100 or even more percent. So it, it, in my view, the economy is going to be destroyed very, very soon. And the destroying of the economy means that, uh, you know, we will win. And also, in my view, we have now two fronts. The first front is that, you know, which is real on, uh, on the ground in Ukraine, when our people, you know, are fighting against this Russian fascist, again, this monster, uh, which is killing our uh, people. But in the, the second front is really the economic front, all these sanctions, they are working. We are destroying them economically. And destroying Russia economically, maybe even uh, ha has the same importance as the ground operation in our country. So from this point of view, I'm happy that we are united. And I am happy that U.S. has this leading role. So, and I am very much sure that after uh, Monster is destroyed, we will have, of course, we are going to have negative economic effect, effects all over the world, including Russia, uh, including the United States in a short run. But in the medium term, it's going to be a correction. But in the long run, we all will win because the world is going to be more civilized, because the world is going to be more secure, because the businesses are going to be working in a safely environment. And that means that we are going to benefit after the monster is destroyed. Thank you uh, again, Oleg, for that uh, comprehensive answer. Um, one, one other very concrete thing that I think uh, many people uh, around the world uh, worry about, and I'm sure many, many people, all people in Ukraine, <coughs> excuse me, also are concerned, uh, concerns the general uh, energy situation also in Ukraine. We have obviously heard a lot about energy sanctions already, but uh, as you, you know, Ukraine also has an economy, it's fighting a war. Uh, and you are a country that, at least pre-war, uh, relied on about 50% of your energy from uh, nuclear power. Unfortunately, we have seen how nuclear power plants have become a direct uh, uh, attack or, or uh, a target uh, by Russian forces. Um, so I was wondering if you could you could comment on the sort of domestic energy situation and literally how do you keep uh, the wheels uh, running uh, in Ukraine at the moment? Uh, even if, if there is, I suppose, one positive aspect, which is that we know that the Ukrainian electricity grid will soon be uh, uh, connected to the EU grid uh, uh, and no longer therefore be as dependent on Russia. But basically, how do you keep the run, the, the, the economic, uh, the energy uh, wheels spinning in Ukraine uh, while the war is going on? Uh, look, this is definitely not my area of expertise, but what I can tell you from what I hear in the office is that uh, the decision that we are going to be disconnected in on all possible ways from Russia is already taken. No gas, no oil, nothing from Russia at all. Complete embargo on everything related to Russia. In terms of our nuclear stations, uh, the latest which I knew a uh, couple of days uh, before the aggression, there was a meeting in the office of the president uh, where uh, we all heard that 15 reactors on our stations were in use. Uh, our, you know, our policy even at that time was to disconnect from Russia as much as possible and to be connected to the European system. My understanding of what I heard from the Minister uh, of Energy is that this is, uh, this is a general direction uh, for the uh, system. I could not really comment more on that except that you know all these terrible things when Russians are in uh, Ergodar, uh, where they are, you know, keeping, uh, keep, 
keep keeping their cycle around the station. So I even uh, for me, it's hard uh, to comment on what uh, what finally they would like from that. They are trying to speculate on that because you have a, ma- a monkey with a you know with a bomb in its hands. So you never know what the monkey is going to do with that. Uh, you know, nuclear station, and you are absolutely right. It's an extremely, you know, challenging situation in many ways, but including nuclear safety as well. That's why it's another reason uh, to stop the war as soon as possible. And again, without, uh, you know, uh, great support uh, from United States, plus lives, United States and Ukraine in Europe, it would be next to impossible. So this is a time when we have to be united, altogether united. Otherwise, you know, the world will be uh, completely different from what from what we thought about the world even you know three weeks ago. Well, thank you, Oleg. Again, uh, I would like to shift now to uh, asking, uh, conveying some of the questions from our audience, uh, or even more questions from our audience. So again, if some of you have additional questions for for Oleg, please uh, utilize the email link that you have uh, been given. Uh, I've got a a couple of questions here uh, that concerns, we've already talked about what your priorities for uh, uh, financial help will be, but there's a number of uh, specific questions here concerning the recent uh, $14 billion package passed by the House of Representatives. Uh, If you could speak to, you know, the non-military part uh, of of your priorities, the financial and, and if you like, civilian aid, uh, what would you like uh, uh, to spend that, uh, or what would you like to be, to, what would you like to have in that package uh, on on uh, financial and uh, civilian aid? Look, uh, for, for one more time, they're very important for us, really crucial for us is uh, basically to have an, uh, it, it's, it's not the civilian side, it's to have a military equipment. Military equipment is everything for us, you know, it's the most important item. Uh, all the rest is also very important, but not the, the, the most priorities, weapons, our weapons and ammunition for our army, for our uh, military people. This is the most priority without any doubts. In terms of civilians, what we really need, we need to support people who are, uh, you know, uh, were moved uh, out of the country. They have to have a source of income and they are not able to work, so we have to support them. So partly it might be uh, used as a transfer uh, to those people who are, um, you know, temporarily uh, refugees uh, all over the world. Uh, first of all, in uh, countries which are uh, in Europe close to us, uh, Poland, for example, and other countries in Europe where our people are. But look, we have already uh, the, the statistics uh, which we have so far uh, was shocking. Something like uh, 2.2 million of our uh, people already uh, abroad. They crossed the border and they are somewhere in Europe. So these people uh, don't have a source of income. So we can use this money to support these people. People who are here in Ukraine and who were moved from uh, big cities so from the cities or from the territories which were under the, under attack of uh, Russian fascists, they also don't have a uh, source uh, for, uh, of income and, and they, it's difficult for them to survive. Obviously, you know, other people, other Ukrainians helping as much as they can. You can uh, find, uh, you know, uh, free uh, housing, you can find uh, some free food, but uh, for how long it will, you know, land. Uh, plus, uh, you know, we are talking about uh, normal, ordinary Ukrainians, uh, those who are, you know, hosting uh, these temporarily moved uh, persons. They don't have enough income, even, you know, under these circumstances to support their own families. And But at 
the same time they're willing to support those who were uh, moved to their houses, uh, who, whom they're having, uh, you know, so kindly in their houses. So these people has also to have, uh, maybe we can use part of this money uh, to support uh, Ukrainians. And it's not difficult to do. We have this ETS system in Ukraine, so everybody in his uh, cell phone uh, will have, you know, so-called idea where you can um, get all messages from the government and uh, we already uh, tried this system when we were uh, sending uh, some money to Ukrainians uh, after they had this uh, COVID vaccination. So we know how to use the system. So I guess that in this sense, it will be uh, working properly for all Ukrainians all over the world, not even, you know, who are still in Ukraine, but those who were um, who are refugees. So it, it's also, uh, you know, the way how it can be used. Another way, of course, of using this money is uh, to send us, um, you know, food. We need food, uh, we need uh, clothes, we need everything which is, uh, you know, to cover basic needs of uh, uh, Ukrainians. Uh, of even if the war is stopped, uh, look, the assets are destroyed, as I said, the 100 billion assets are destroyed already. So people uh, can move back to their houses if uh, those houses are still alive, not destroyed. But then you still have to support these people for some period of time. And uh, having this having this fund uh, um, to support Ukrainians, I don't know, uh, 20, 40, 50 dollars a day will be already something which uh, would be really highly appreciated uh, by Ukrainians. They have to understand that, you know, the, there are people not only in the country, but internationally and the United States in particular, who are thinking about their daily lives. And, this is very symbolic, and this is a signal that, look, you are not alone in this world. You have some very powerful world players who are supporting you, and, they, and this coalition, uh, powerful international coalition, is led now by United States, and I think that United States has, you know, a huge role there. Thank you, thank you, Oleg. Um, I've got a, I've got a couple, uh, actually, a number of questions about how you and your colleagues in in Kiev view the economic role of China in your confrontation with Russia. I mean, one thing, of course, is that the sanctions that we've been talking about are not really Western sanctions, right? I mean, they're really at least uh, G7 uh, plus other advanced economies in Asia have joined. Uh, so the only truly important, if you like, uh, uh, in trading partner of Russia that hasn't joined is China. Uh, how, how do you view China's economic role in this conflict uh, uh, from Kiev? Look, look we, are, <laughs> we are discussing this issue day and night uh, or, or in, in Ukraine. And even this morning, uh, when we were discussing China and Russia and the uh, possibility to use China and what is the role of China uh, in all this, uh, you know, uh, situation, that I would say that I have a very strong view that the only uh, country who really has benefits now from all this uh, armed conflict war in Ukraine is really China. China uh, will have a much weaker Russia next to her. China will be uh, having benefits from the uh, from oil, which it will be able to buy from Russia in the future. China is going to be, even this is what uh, we were discussing this morning, might be a connector between Russia and all the rest of the rest of the world. So I, I could hardly believe that Russians are going to be, within the next years, be able uh, to move forward the energy that they, are, uh, they will be having. 
assuming that they are, you know, that the uh, war is stopped. So the only communicator for them is going to be China. China is definitely, uh, China definitely has benefits out of all this, you know, terrible uh, monster stuff which we uh, are experiencing now. But at the same time, it's hard for me uh, to comment uh, on uh, political or geopolitical, uh, you know, side. Uh, of Russia, uh, of China, do we really believe uh, that uh, we can use China uh, in the peace process? Uh, do we really trust uh, to China? Uh, do we really uh, believe that Russians are going to be open in front of China? Later on, they will be because they will not have any other choice. But China is definitely an important player now. And since, uh, you know, China is trying, you know, to distance from all that stuff, it doesn't mean that they are not, you know, that somebody in Beijing is sitting like, you know, uh, feeling happy of, uh, you know, weakening in Russia now. Plus, still, remember that uh, China will be happy uh, to, have, to make a list for some territories of Russia. You, you know, and it's marketable uh, in Russia as well. And even now, when I was watching um, uh, what, what I mentioned, you know, uh, what they are doing now in Russia, uh, in Russia, you can see, you know, the, this, uh, different videos. Uh, of, many of them are kind of propaganda video, but you can see the private channels, uh, uh, video channels in Russia. And uh, what they are showing now, they are showing uh, some videos are coming. Yes, now we have only one great friend for us, and this great friend is China. So they are talking. They started to talk about China. Uh, I mean, these ordinary people. But I assume that uh, nothing, you know, like random happened in Russia. So the, this is kind of course, or you know, it's directed by somebody. Uh, within Russia. And another set of videos you can, which you can uh, see now in Russia, and it's becoming more and more and more aggressive. Uh, over the last, I would say, two, three days, uh, I saw videos when Russians, like, you know, like big Russian uh, animal uh, who is talking about, okay, remember last time we were in Berlin, we were in Paris, we were in Vienna. We have to do the same now, but this time it's going to be different from last time. This time we will go to Berlin, directly to Berlin and to Paris and to some uh, other European cities, and we will stay there. We will not come back to Russia. The, these uh, two, you know, these two uh, different ways uh, of, uh, you know, discussions they are having now uh, in Russia in terms of geopolitical. Uh, stuff. This is what they are trying to put into the brain uh, of uh, their ordinary uh, people. So for, for me, it's a signal. It's a signal on both sides in terms of China and in terms of uh, their willingness uh, to move further if uh, Ukrainians are not able to win. And I assume that we are winning and very much sure that we are already winning. But this is a logic which uh, somebody from the, uh, you know, really uh, with enough, uh, uh, you know, competence in that kind of stuff uh, should be given us, you know, his view or her view in terms of that kind of, uh, you know, uh, situation, uh, which is currently running in Russia. Well, thank you very much, uh, Oleg. We uh, we have reached our one hour witching hour. And uh, again, uh, on behalf of the Peterson Institute and our audience, I would like to thank you uh, very, very much for uh, being with us uh, for this hour and sharing your uh, views and expertise on what's going on in Ukraine. And I hope uh, by hosting you here, we have uh, been, been, a, been a helping hand uh, in your efforts, and uh, we look very much forward to uh, 
having you uh, visit us again online or in person as a representative of a free uh, Ukraine. Uh, so once again, Oleg, thank you very much. Thank you very much. And thank you very much for sending to Ukraine. Thank you, Beth. Thank you. I appreciate that very much. Appreciate it.